I'd forgotten to press record, so I've done that now. Um, and also, if you have questions throughout this evening, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, that means that I can pick those up and we can sort out asking those um, of Rob as we go through the session. Um, um, but please do use the chat to kind of have a have a quick like informal chat and say hello to people. Make sure if you're using the chat that you select everyone from the send chat to button, otherwise it'll just come to me and Rob um, and everyone else won't be able to see it. So Rob, are we all right to, to crack on? Uh, I think you're gonna share your screen and I'll hand over to you. We can see your screen, Rob, but you're on mute at the moment. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you and we've got the screen. Just need you to put it in present mode and we'll be good to go. Excellent. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me um, to speak. Um, so uh, Rob Havard here, Phepps and Angus in Worcestershire. Um, and we've been running our cattle using holistic management for a good few years now. Um, I think we started out in about 2012 and I did my first um, holistic management training in November 2013, something like that. Um, and there's a good few of us who were on those early courses in the Pasture Fed Livestock Association and we've all sort of shared uh, experiences and I'll, I'll share some of those tonight hopefully about what's worked and what hasn't worked for us. Um, the vast majority of, of anything that I talk about tonight, I've stolen from other people. So uh, whether it's Kurt Gadzia, who ran the first course, or from the Alan Savory books, Greg Judy books, obviously watching stuff online from other people in the UK. And, the, you know, there's so many good people doing lots of good things at the moment. So I'll, I'll just basically, you know, I'll steal what I can, find out what works. And that's what um, that's kind of what, what we get to uh, with our system at the moment. Uh, next year, we'll have about 110 pedigree Aberdeen Angus cows to the bull, and we should have about 40 pedigree red pole to the bull as well. Um, and then um, we'll obviously be carving those down the following year. Um, so we're just increasing up. We've taken on a, a bit more ground. Um, and this system, really, this low cost system of, of, for tall grass grazing has allowed us to do that. Um, when Nikki asked me to speak, it was because there'd been some questions on the forum about stockpiling grass. Have I got too much grass going into winter? Do I need to sort of graze it all out? How should I manage it? Um, and so, you know, we do it a certain way. And if what we do helps, then then fantastic. And, you know, happy to take any questions. I'll do about 40 minutes and then we'll hopefully have about 20 minutes questions at the end, hopefully. So here's the first picture here is is uh, these are some steers that i bought off another pfla member um so they came grass fed and we finished them here uh, we bought them in at about um i think they were about 17 months when we brought them in and we took them through to finishing around about 28 months um and they all finished um beautifully off pasture um, and, you know, have a look at that photo and have a think about what you're seeing. They're basically coming for a move at this point. Um, and uh, this is a couple of years ago now. It was probably more than that. Um, and, um, you know, just have a think of what you can see in the picture. We'll come back to that picture later. Nikki mentioned holistic management. Um, I found it, and for our business here, it's, it's what's made the difference out of anything. Um, there's lots of uh, buzzwords around regenerative agriculture whether, and the grazing systems, whether it's mob grazing, whether it's holistic grazing, whether it's uh, tall grass grazing, adaptive multi paddock grazing, management intensive grazing, um, ultra high density grazing, uh, skim grazing, you name it, you know, there's uh, severe grazing, you know, everyone's got um, 
their own thing to sell and their own ideas. But ultimately, for me, in my opinion, Alan Savory's work is where it all started. Um, and actually, if you look at all the minutiae of all those different grazing systems, what you'll see is that those are all just tools, uh, essentially, that can be used. They're different grazing tools that can be used by us. And it's only the holistic management framework that you, allows us to use all of those grazing systems. It doesn't tie you down to you must have this residual, you must graze this much and you must clean it out or graze it right down or you must leave enough. You've got flexibility and all of those things might be the right thing to do at different times. And the framework really helps us to make good decisions on what we're doing with the grazing. Don't want to make it sound like it's too onerous or or if if we're making perfect decisions all the time because i think probably the 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 truth of it is that we're making imperfect decisions all the time um but that i, I won't go through the whole thing today but it, it it's made a massive difference for us we've gone from 44 to over a thousand acres um you know we've got uh, a successful pedigree Aberdeen angus business that we've been able to build flip through cash flow you know it's not come in from some outside capital uh, we've had to grow the business from from what we can make from it. Um, I just go through with just one of the interesting things. I love this quote. So I've used this before. Some of you who see me speak or do seen something on this before. But I love that quote. But I, it's interesting to me thinking about the, the huge numbers of large herbivores that we had grazing grasslands um, in prehistory. Um, and... I think one of the, you know, when you think about what they would need to sustain them over winter is essentially stockpile forage. And if we know that prehistory, the, you know, from the fossil record, more or less, slightly more, if we had more or less the same or slightly more large tonnage of wild herbivores in prehistory to, the, to modern times, even with all the maize and the extra crops we grow to feed them, it tells us something about the, the ability of us to feed our stock with stockpile. You know, how did they survive through the winter? What, what were they eating? Um, and, um, you know, and, and how did that work? And so a lot of what we try and do, you know, all of us who try and do holistic grazing is try and look at natural systems, natural processes. How can we mimic them to try and, you know, use um, sort of that, the grass growth that we get kind of free each year uh, and make the most of it as, as much as we can. Um, one of the first things when you read Alan Savory's book is he, he quotes um, Andre Vozan really early on as one of the first people who switched him on to um, some of the ideas. And, uh, and he's actually, Alan Savory has said that Vozan's work is probably the most appropriate for um, all of us here in temperate United Kingdom. So if you haven't already read Grass Productivity, you must get a copy. It's absolutely brilliant. And, um, uh, you know, it's got something in there for everyone. I mean, we're organic. We don't use fertilizer, but it's got quite a lot on efficient fertilizer use as well. Um, and so you can have a look at I recommend having a look at that. One of the key things that we look at, and some of you have seen this before, is first law of rational grazing, which is that before a sward sheared with the animal's teeth can achieve its maximum productivity, sufficient interval must have elapsed between two successive shearings to allow the grass to accumulate in its roots the reserves necessary for a vigorous spurt of regrowth. Essentially, it's all about rest. Um, and what we try and do is make sure that we're not grazing the regrowing plant. We need to apply that rest. So if we reckon on about day four, um, that regrowing plant in the summer becomes regrazable. Um, now, the reason why that's relevant to stockpiling grass is that we find that if we don't follow that rule and we, you know, there's areas that inevitably we have to regraze because we're in that paddock because of a TB test that's required or we've got to move some animals that are going for sale. We need to bring them closer to the handling pens or whatever it is. But we can look at the productivity in those paddocks and see that where we don't allow sufficient rest, uh, for them to restore the energy back in the roots and crown before regrowing, then we just don't see particularly the late summer growth and the late summer autumn growth where what really what you need to build that stockpile up. Um, obviously, we use electric fences, and so that allows us to meter out and control the grazing 
I won't go into too much detail on that because I think probably most of you are fully aware of, of using those to meter them out. Um, and so I'll show you this picture again, which is from, we're looking at kind of cattle, as I said before, but we do the same when we're carving through May and June as well. Um, and so just from a grass point of view, we're already planning for our stockpile when we're grazing through in May in, in May and June. And it doesn't mean that um, that if you haven't done that, you can't still try and graze some stockpile. This autumn weather at the moment has been absolutely fantastic for grass growth. So uh, most people should have a fair bit, fair good cover across the farms to, to graze in the winter or across the shoulders of the year from autumn into winter. And what we find is what we're trying to do is leap you know, I've heard Greg Judy talk about leaving four inches as a minimum. Um, the more I do of it, the more we actually will actually try and leave almost as much as we dare is, is kind of what I, I say to people. Leave as much as you dare. And, and different people have different views on, on, what, on what the residu residual should be. But if you look in the picture, you should be able to see that the... Um, you can see there's lots of oxide daisies. We're leaving a lot of forage behind. And what we tend to find is that, you know, we want to leave plenty of flowering plants behind so that we've got lots of seed, seed drop for the wildflowers. Um, and the bits that have been grazed off, they'll actually come back and flower later in the season. So by managing like this, we actually extend the flowering period right into November because of how we're grazing and the rest periods we put in and because we're not grazing everything all at once. Um, I know there are some people out there who say you have to take everything down and you have to take it all away. Um, but the one of the reasons we do this is, is partly because if we've always left loads behind, then we've always got another pass ahead of us. And so when we come into the winter and we hit the dormant season, which for us is usually around about somewhere at the, about the 1st of December, um, we know we've got a whole platform ahead of us in terms of grazing that stockpile down. Um, and so, I mean, the other advantage is as well through the summer that you've obviously got lots of grass covering the soil right through the year. And if you have a really hot, dry summer, um, then actually the fact that you've left lots behind and you come for a second pass is is a really good thing. Because as soon as you get get rain, it's going to grow on well. But leaving plenty behind is going to leave the soil covered. Um, but it's also going to uh, mean that you've always got another another round. Whereas if you're taking everything off, then it can be, you know, you can if you get an extended drought, then you can be left with nothing. If you graze it right down, you know, I've tried that um, and you can end up, you know, having looking back for sort of two months and actually see very little regrowth because uh, there simply wasn't the moisture for it. So it's just a bit of an insurance and it just means that we've always got forage on the farm. Um, this is just an illustration. Don't look at the words on here too much. Um, but the key thing is, is to see what happens if you if you regraze. So where you can see something's been grazed on where it says day one, but you've still got a, a really nice big root mass. And we find this that actually grazing off doesn't reduce the, the root mass. Um, dug holes and we've had a look at stuff. The key thing is if you allow rest to happen if you, and if you don't regraze it, then the, the root mass stays the same. And that's massive because if we're if we're going to be grazing in the autumn and the winter, we need to have really good soil structure. And if you look at this kind of grass as well, this is a bunch grass you're looking at. So that's something like a coxfoot or a tall fescue, something like that. Um, and the interesting thing about those plants is that, you know, you'll see them in, a, in swords where there's, you know, maybe a more of a New Zealand three leaf system or people graze, grazing everything right down uh, to the ground. And, and it's but you, you're not getting the tussock. And if you don't get that full tussock on those bunch grasses, then you're not going to get the root development. The plant, those kinds of plants have to reach their full genetic potential in terms of the tussock, which might be over a foot in diameter. Um, and, you know, the grass plants themselves can sort of be the grass can be at least waist high and I you know I'm six foot two and and you know you'll have the seed heads above my head um you know from those so you can grow huge quantities of forage and even if you don't eat it all if it goes a bit brown you can still trample it in and it's feeding the soil but the key thing for us is keeping the animals up out of the mud in the winter 
And so we need that root mass there. And if we don't allow those plants to express their full genetic potential because we keep grazing it really short with severe grazing, they simply will not develop into what we need them to be. Um, you can see on the right, if we regraze it, that, that then will kill off root mass because it's got to find energy and starch from somewhere then to regrow the plant. And it's got to take it from, you know, what's left of the plant. So, um, so that's just a point really to say, I know there's a, some people who do the severe grazing will do that. And then, the, but the following year, I know that Jamie Elizondo, he doesn't always state this, but it's important that people don't get confused that where he severe graze is in North America, he then follows that up with a 12 month rest on the severely grazed pasture. So it does allow these bunch grasses to develop to a greater extent than if you just severe graze all the time. Um, and I think you, some people miss that point and then they end up having you know muddy autumn winters when they haven't got the root mass. That's just another example that as a rule of thumb, more or less, you'll get the same above and below ground biomass in terms of depth, in terms of size and in terms of weight. And so obviously, if you let the plants grow to their full potential and the root mass can also do the same thing. Um, and that, that's a bit of continuous grazing, which obviously doesn't allow very many plants except the weeds to, to have that impact. Um, and the same with, the, with our diversity and the forage and the forbs, um, the flowering plants as well. Uh, they can be impacted greater by regrazing. So you lose that diversity. And if you lose the diversity in, in, the, in the plant species, then you're going to lose the diversity in the root structures. You know, so you'll have some species, for example, if I just focus on grasses, we can look at, um, well, we can look at red fescue, which is quite a matte grass. Uh, it's not deep, not that deep rooted, but that mat effect is fantastic for holding cattle up. Um, same with yarrow, actually, as a, as a flowering plant doing the same. And then obviously you've got the deeper rooting grasses, which, um, you know, help us with infiltration and just providing the architecture, the structure, uh, like the scaffolding within the soil that holds everything up. Um, so if you don't have the diversity, then you don't have that. Um, the other thing we think about is is how we're going to plan our grazing for the winter. And so you want to be thinking about that. So if you think that we're, we're sort of skimming across the top, leaving as much as we dare right through the summer, so that we know we're hopefully when we hit dormant season, we're leaving as much as possible behind um, so that we've got something to graze, you know, almost a full wedge of about three and a half thousand kilos of dry matter per hectare when we get to that winter grazing. And we might think about this, this picture of this imaginary farm here and where it says CREP program, that's a conservation program area, but that could be on a little bit of a hill and maybe it's really free draining. Um, you know, is there part of it that isn't so sensitive that you could perhaps extend your time there by some cheap feeding of hay? Um, we try and spread out the feeding of hay where we can, but Again, it's important not to be too dogmatic about this. If you've got a dry area, which you can drive a tractor up to and drop a bale every day, or if you've got a load of bales there, put there already, you can just keep rolling a bale in the similar place every day. There's no, you know, there's no issue with that. If it, if it creates cheap wintering for you and it's not doing environmental damage and it's adding organic matter to the soil, then as far as I'm concerned, it's all good. Um, we don't need to be dogmatic and say you should or shouldn't do this. Um, you want to have a look at the water points. Um, so we'll often in the winter on one of the farms at Croom Court, there's a there's a very long, about a mile long man-made river. Um, so it's actually a lake, but it's it's a landscape feature. And so we'll save the grass along the Croom River um, so that if we get, you know, an extended frozen spell where water pipes aren't going to, to work, then um, we'll, we know we can get them grazing something next to water. Um, the other thing we'll think about as well is, um, you know, saving bits next to the where the standpipes are. So we will graze the bits furthest away from where the water comes out of the uh, out of the ground. So we've only got to defrost a, a small section. Um, and we've even done things like emptying the pipe overnight. So you might have, let's say you've got one water trough where you could take um, you know, those big lick tubs, you could go and fill four of, 
five of those at about four o'clock if you've got the water flowing. Um, leave those overnight and then in the morning, then you empty the pipe at about four o'clock. Uh, and then in the morning, you've only got a short bit to, um, to defrost. It might seem like quite a lot of work to do, but believe you me, if you just spend half an hour doing that the night before, it saves an awful lot of hassle the next morning if you've got 150 metres of pipe overground to defrost. Um, so just thinking about where you're grazing, where you're going to put them in winter, you might want to think about you've got a nice dry spell like we've just had now. And if that carried on into dormant season when we start hitting the grazing the winter stockpile, you probably want to think about grazing your, your wetter places first. So that so anywhere that you think if you know if we had a real wet spell we couldn't graze that, um, then you, you know that's the time to hit it when you can. Um, now obviously sometimes that's not you know things aren't going to work out and you might you know some years in really wet years we. We ended up, you know, one wet, really wet year, we ended up buying a fair bit more hay so we could feed in dry places and, and put that out. So it's just trying to um, sort of measure it to the season uh, and make sure that, you know, if you think about it over the five year average, you know, if that was one year in five where we had to do that, then you spread that cost out and you still got a much lower wintering cost. And the cattle, are, I just find the cattle are a lot happier outside over winter. So mobile water troughs allow us to meter it out. That was on Tim May's farm. As I thought it was a really nice, innovative um, feature that Tim had done. He's, uh, you know, doing some great stuff down there on the King's Clear Estate. You know, big fan of what they're doing there. Um, um, and we use overland pipes. Um, it says Quick Connect on there, but we don't actually use those Quick Connect anymore. We use uh, the Plasson, just standard screw-in fittings. Um, takes 30 seconds more or less than that probably to unscrew and put back on um, and they're very strong and, and sturdy i wouldn't use another connector than a plus on now so that's kind of looking at what our stockpile often looks like it probably that's from a few years ago now it probably looks a bit spikier now um, that was actually early on on that farm uh, about a second year after we took it on so the um the coxfoot hasn't really gone all tussocky in, in this yet but now it's a lot more tussocky so we and that helps again it helps the structure it stands the grass up um, but you can see the sort of there's there's good quality forage on this in this patch and we tend to find that you know on average throughout the whole year we were doing 0.8 kilos of live weight gain per day on these finishing steers this is an angus steer you can see here um, so you know without any hay on this on this this year we did no hay it was all stockpile grazing um the rent's not too much on this one and so actually if we're making 0.8 kilos a day that's actually is pretty good margin you know it's as good as anything to be honest um you know there's very little cost in the job um one of the other things to consider that you do see without wintering and i uh, as a ecologist and some has worked for environmental charities i will say I've, I've seen this more on nature reserve type situations where the cow on the right is not getting uh, enough they've been it's been kept on very short amount of pasture they might be quite extensive but you know the they're probably not getting enough roughage to properly ruin, ruminate and a rumen should be able to ruminate um, and whereas if you look at the picture on the left where there's some fattening steers in here um, and you know they're holding condition beautifully and they're getting rather than have if you think about it, if you just let them roam a nature reserve for the whole winter pretty much from dormance the start of dormant season everything gets worse every day because they walk over the whole lot they keep grazing and, uh, and every day it gets worse it gets trodden on it doesn't grow back so that, you know, the, the bite of nutrition they get each day is going down on a, on a declining plane of nutrition. Whereas when you're metering it out with the with electric fences and giving them a day or two at a time, uh, and actually we're sort of looking at this and, and finding that, you know, on wetter areas, we'll definitely be thinking of giving them larger areas. I'd rather give them a bigger area for three days uh, they seem to make a bit less mess. So we're just sort of playing around with that at, at the moment. We haven't got that perfect. 
Um, some areas we even give them like bigger areas for sort of five or six or seven days because you haven't got to worry about regrazing. Um, and because we roll bales out, that's made us realise that, um, you know, sometimes the bigger areas, you know, we might hold them on for 10 days on some paddocks um, because we're rolling bales in. Um, and, we've, and we've actually found that the bigger, the better with those paddocks. So, you know, play around with it. Again, we're back to that picture. <laughs> um you know we're really just trying to make sure we've got enough left behind as we go through um but leaving so yeah leaving enough behind also means we've got lots of wildflowers you can see on the left of that picture there's a broom rape which is a i think i'll get the word right saprozylic plant which basically is a parasite a hemi parasite um or a compl uh, complete parasite so it just lives on decaying um plant material i think that's the interesting thing to see that coming coming in because we're trampling so much plant material into the soil we now have these plants that live off decaying uh, decaying plant material and it, uh, it you can see it's not green because it doesn't need chlorophyll because it just it's just leaving off the off the dead matter lots of orchids uh, they just seem to come in wherever we start this system. They love the system. I think there's just lots of fungal activity going on. Um, you see some drop work we've got there. I think I'm looking at some quaking grass, um, some meadow saxifrage as well here. So diversity is really important. And particularly if we're looking at autumn winter grazing, it's also really important for wildlife. So we've had grey partridge pop up on their own. Um, we get a lot of um, short-eared owls and um, coming in, and which is lovely. Um, and they'll roost in the grass. Um, well, they come through on passage with um, little egrets. And we actually, I'm pretty sure, last week Sarah and I saw a a, a great egret on there on over at Crew. So they're starting to come in, and we've had great grey shrike. You can see they're eating a vole huge vole populations when we leave a lot of grass cover and the voles just help with the with the uh, barn owls they help with the kestrels um, but little birds of prey and you know barn owls will come in within a couple of years of us taking a farm on you'll see a lot of them about and the starlings just follow the cattle um, and stone chats as well we find we have stone chats seem to overwinter lovely and and they do you know they seem to do well all the extra dung invertebrates through a much longer season really helps so in terms of the performance of the cattle um so on when we were finishing cattle off that stockpiled forage um all the cattle finish off grass alone by 28 months average all of them were under 30 months when they were finished which is obviously what you need um and so that you know making 0.8 kilos a day that was with no supplementary feed whatsoever, just some mineral uh, salt, salt licks. That was all mineralized salt, salt licks. That's all they had. Um, and that really low cost system has allowed me to take on uh, ground because, you know, one of the challenges with cattle, you know, as I'm sure you will find is that you've obviously, when you put the bull in, it's two and a half years before you get paid. So there's a lot of money out the door in that time. And if you've got a system where there's a lot of inputs right from the word go, if you've got reseeds and you've got all this and that, you know, there's a lot of money to get back. And so it, there's a balance between cost benefit from all your activity on that. Um, and, you know, I've, I don't see a huge financial benefit when you average the good and bad years out in terms of price um i don't see the intensive system really work it works really well in a good price year and a good weather year if the two things combine but you can also be a long way behind on the bad years but we do a gross margin on the such cows of about 600 pounds per head um with a, a net cash profit of over 300 pound per cow um and that's uh, and the other thing we've done with that, with especially with the bales, um, we've we've managed to increase and in trial in probably one of the wettest winters ever. Um, we've managed to have that national average stocking rate as per the AHDB figures. Um, so if so, this is the, this is really important. I think you know if if we can have a national average stocking rate, so we're not reducing the amount of production. You hear a lot of people saying we'd have to eat less meat. But if we can produce at a national average stocking rate, which is about 1.6, 1.8, 1.8 um, acres to a suckler cow, 
um, then that's really exciting because it means that we can massively increase the ecology um, in our you know in our countryside we can you know but at the same time we can have probably more profitable um, family farms um, and you know just to, the the potential here is huge and we don't have to reduce the amount of beef we're, we're producing across the across the nation with this system so it's you know it just it just makes sense and i and i think the potential here is is still huge and i i just and you know we should keep pushing that um here's some of the cattle this is the pedigree angus herd so um this was sort of a september-ish type pit time so again we're trying to leave quite a lot behind um and um you know we're going into quite rough coarse covers and again trying to leave as much as we dare so in terms of the type of animal you know it's interesting with the angus you know we've brought in i've gone to farms and and bought heifers and bought female lines you know 15 females from here and 15 from there and you know we've we've I wanted to get a diverse mix to see what worked and I think what we've found is we need the more compact animal um, with lots of capacity these are two half brothers two bulls that we've used which are they're both full native Angus uh, but they kill out really well the native Angus um, in fact John who I saw was on chat earlier I know he's uh, he's had some of our steers and fattened them and I think maybe, I hope they're quite pleased with what, they, what they've got. Here you can see the summer grazing. So the cows, we're looking for feminine cows, lots of capacity and length. Um, and we look, you know, I won't go into the structure we look for, but I do think we need to balance. It's like that holistic approach. So we need to have the right grassland management. We also need to have the right grass species. So if you like, the grass genetics has got to be right. Um, so we've got the management, the grass genetics, then we will need to also have the animal genetics. I think most of our native breeds can do the job really well with the wintering on the stockpile. Um, but I think a lot of the native breeds have been selected for a bit too much growth. So we just need to almost go back in time a bit and just select for function, um, for structure the calving ease which is essentially just for animal welfare um and as long as they bring a calf every year that's what you need and you need you know some good weaning weights off these off these cows um i won't go into full detail on the cow size stuff um i will just say there's the, the founding female in the angus herd book was a cow called old granny and um i just love the story behind her that she brought a calf every year from the age of two until she was 27 um and the only picture they've got of her is, or a drawing of her she did she looked pretty ropey by 27 to be fair but I, I just think like how with all our ebvs and all our breeding and all our expertise how far have we come since the first cow in the herd book of the angus herd book there's not many cows bringing a calf every year or 25 calves in their lifetime um you know one a year for 25 years but that's what we ought to be aiming for so i think the reality is we've probably gone backwards um you know but i look you know think about the potential we have in pasture fed management to try and get that back to where it should be i'm going to skim through these because i've rattled on too much but that's some autumn diversity in the stockpile so we've got flowering plants right through we set the bales out so that when we we roll them out as we reach them as we graze through in the winter um wildlife coming in um where we roll them out they like the protection of the cattle follow them that's a friend of mine Aaron Nurbass in Canada uh, we're just currently uh, organizing to bring over some of his genetics his Angus genetics so they they are winter on these bale pods minus 40 those aren't his cattle on that one um and we do the same so we have some uh, sacrifice areas where we take them when it's really wet or really snowy so that we can save that winter stockpile uh, from when it's better to graze without buggering up our uh, soil structure too much so we we just mess up these areas uh, that are kind of sacrifice areas but it's interesting to see all that organic matter added into these these actually the soil becomes incredibly resilient after two or three years you just have to keep hitting it um you can see us using that there but the key things is the wintering costs are right down it's great for wildlife low fixed costs 
you haven't got the additional feed costs. You know, I can feed the cattle in the winter without starting a tractor. Um, you know, because with our tra tractors, you go to start it. Hopefully, it starts. Um, but I think also the fact there's low barriers of entry um, for, for uh, doesn't have to be young farmers, for, but for people trying to get in the industry, you know, it's cheap infrastructure and there's potential to you know there's a lot of change coming with subsidies going we need costs down there's going to be opportunities out there and this is a you know this is a potential way of people starting out i think um i won't i'll just leave that up there because i think we're going to get some questions from the group but that's pretty much the the talk finished if you've got any questions about management we've got about 20 minutes hopefully to go through now and, um, and I'll answer anything you have on that. That's brilliant, Rob, thank you so much. Um, will I just give you a minute to stop sharing and we'll probably put videos back on so that folks can see us. Excellent. Thank you so, so much for the presentation. It was really, really interesting and some great photos as well. So um, yeah, really lovely to see those. We do have some questions. Uh, so we'll probably start with the ones that have come in already. Um, first one came from Alistair and he asks, rest or recovery? Well, I think it's gotta be, it's both, isn't it? I mean, it's, we all need rest and recovery. Um, you know, I, I help out with sons, um, rugby team and um i can tell you after helping them on a training session i need rest and recovery afterwards so i think the grass does as well brilliant um then there's some kind of technical questions about measurements and uh, and things like that so we'll get into those so john wants to know how many hay bales per livestock unit you typically feed for outwintering so i guess if people are wanting to budget uh, it's an indicator for them yeah that's a good question so Obviously, it depends on the bale, but we try and um, average a bale so that, it, that it's about 20 cows. One bale does about 20 cows. Well, that's what it was last year. About 20 cows uh, per day. So what we'll tend to do as this kind of average, it doesn't always work like this, but we'll try and have um, two days of grazing. So we'll graze the stockpile first. So they eat that first. So they're then hungry. We find if we if we roll the bales in before they've had the stockpile, they'll waste it. So make them eat it. And in terms of the finish we're looking for, I think, as I said, we're leaving as much as we dare through the summer. But in the winter, it's quite important for us. We'll graze it as tight as we can without poaching it. So we want to open up that sward. And at that point in the year, we do actually want to get quite quite tight i mean being winter we can't do that too much and that allows you know we, it allows us to find the right balance then we'll say we've got a mob of 40 cows then that's that gets going to be two bales a day rolled in um now it's it's me me working on on um on and sarah and in march this year we were still rolling a few bales in and i did my back in um because it got a bit soggy and i you know get older um, we actually went down from a uh, four foot bale to a four foot bale just to make them easier to roll in for both myself and Sarah who works for us um, and you know so there we're probably going to be down to about 15 cows per day per bale so we'll have to maybe you know if there's we've got one mob at the moment about six cows so that's you know we, we're going to have to put more than three bales a day in there rolled in so it's just You've got to work it out. And to be honest, I would always err on the side of giving them more to start with. So if you think you can, you know, if you if you think you can give them more so that you can always roll that extra bale in, it's not a huge cost in the great scheme of things. But I'd rather have full cows if you've got them outside. Um, and so that was you went from fives to four foot. You said there was a question that came in for, from Fidelity, just wanting to double check the size of the bales. Was it? five to four yeah so we were on four foot sixes um but we've gone down four foot by round bales just because they're easier to roll for no other reason and um and that's just for everyone just so it's a, a more pleasurable experience for everyone i mean i think the i'll go the other point i'll say is that you know let's say you've got a, a mob of 40 and you've got a bale that feed 20 cows for a day if we roll 
two out and the day before, let's say it's a wet area and there was a lot of rain and you had a lot of wastage, the next day I might roll three out. So, and that means I'm going to have to move on quicker than I'd wanted to from that patch. Um, and so, and it might be, you know, if you if you end up, so I'll give an example, so let's say I'm grazing through the platform and I've had to do that because it's a wet year more often than I would like, I'm going to get to the end of the grazing platform before I plan to. But I'm going to know that ahead of time. I'm going to know how much I'm speeding up. And so I'll look at that sacrifice paddock where I've got all the bales set out. Um, and we will um, we'll just add some more bales. You know, if we get a dry time or a frost, then we'll just add them in at that point. Brilliant. Um, and you said a word there which I wanted to come to, which was waste. Um, so for folk who maybe haven't been bale grazing, there's this real concern about wasting forage and that it being trampled into the ground. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. I mean, again, you probably predictable answer. I don't see it as waste. It, we get a lot of uh, fertilizer benefits. Obviously, they're urinating and they're uh, cow patting next to where they're eating quite often. So you get that benefit where you roll a bale. If, to be honest, if it's really wet and they're lying on a lot of it, then I just think, well, they, at least they've got a dry bed. Um, and, you know, what I have done in the past, if you're concerned about waste, is I'll roll the bale out. Um, and this is really good for keeping cattle quiet as well. I'll just take a pike with me and I'll just fluff it up so it's not flat across the floor, but I'll make sure that it's, you know, so it can shed some rain and it can withstand them. And, you know, and then you'll get that stupid old cow who decides to walk in the middle of what you've just fluffed. It up. But, you know, just do a little bit. It can it can save some hay if you've got the time to do it. Um, but yeah, I don't think it is. I don't think it is waste. In the wettest year that we ever had, which was the wettest on record, I think, for our area, we ended up um, in terms of cost. If you were to have them in a shed and you were feeding them hay and you were bedding down, then the cost of the waste, which we worked out, was no more than if we were bedding them down in a shed. In dry years, it's much, much better. And, and actually, if you're on frosty days or if you get dry periods in winter, there'll be very, very little waste if you do it right. Brilliant. And um, I mean, something that we've done, obviously, with the wee mob, where we're not getting through a bale a day, is that we are using the electric fence over the top of the hay, which kind of can manage how much they're able to access, which works really well. Um, for I know there's a couple of people on the call who've got smaller herds, and so they might be worried about it being kind of left out for ages, but you can manage how much the animals get access to by using your electric fences. Um, there, right, I'm going to get onto these questions. They're coming in thick and fast, hundreds of them. So um, we've got a question. How many acres per suckler cow, did you say? It just, I, I probably shouldn't have gone for a target, um, but I just wanted to see what we should do. So it was probably a bit of um, ego, people telling me that I wouldn't be able to get the same stocking rate as, as, as conventional systems. So I looked at the AHDB figures from their better returns program and we and it's one about i think it's an average of 1.8 to 1.6 um acres per suck of cow uh and her car and so we achieved that with our outwintering system um so that was the national average but i st can't stress this enough we did that and because i was pig-headed and it was a really wet year and I didn't sell cattle. I could see it was going to be wet. I should have sold cattle, but I was going to try and see what I could do. Um, so don't hold on to that. You know, that's another thing. You've got flexibility in the system. You can always sell some livestock. If things are getting wet and it's, you know, it's January and you've had you've had a very wet December and you can see the forecast, long-term forecast is, is more rain for January, February and into March, then sell some cattle, you know. I, you know, or even better before now start selling them. But just try and manage that and don't, you know, don't hold to those. I don't like to people to have targets. You just want to do what works. And if you're doing it for the first time, always start at a lower stocking density. So if you're currently housing, just outwinter some to start with and then slowly increase to see how your ground can cope with it and what you're comfortable with. And you'll still save money. 
and just over time and then you can work out the cost benefit of either having a whole herd in or just your young stock or whatever it is. Brilliant, Rob. Do you, um, there's a question about, are you buying in hay or are you making your own? Um, so I guess in terms of concerned about what's in the hay, um, if you're buying it in and managing some of those challenges. Yeah, so we do, I have bought in hay, but I know where it comes from. So I know if I'm buying hay, I know I've been doing it long enough now that the farmers around here know what I'm after. There's so the you know I know who's got the steward the sort of stewardship hay, um, and that you know people will. So I'm getting often diverse hay, but the reality is now, well, what I've tried to do is take on ground that has diversity in it. So I go and have a look at the the sites, and I've taken on hay ground that's triple SI and full of diversity so that we can add that to the pastures when we take on new land you know we want to try and increase the diversity and the, and the hay rolling is a brilliant way to do that. Got more hay questions <laughs> they're coming thick and fast so um, do you try and reseed after you have um, had the animals on a sacrifice or a bale grazed area or does it just depend on the damage um, and also do you use a bale and roller? No, you're looking at bale and roller. So that's what we tend to do is is I put the <laughs> I put the bales uh, so round side towards the electric fence. I roll them up to the electric fence so that they're just touching. And this is getting into a bit of detail, but there's a little technique to this. So we'll, I'll then cut the um, the net wrap on bale while it's touching, and then you can imagine the cows on the other side are all starting to gather. Um, and then I'll, I'll hold on to the net wrap and then roll the bale over so that when sort of about, about three feet into the paddock, um, you've got the bale then on the ground, net wraps finished, and you then keep rolling and the bale and rolls from that point. Um, I find if you roll the bale in and then you've got to sort the net wrap out afterwards, it can be a bit fun, you know, a bit of a problem with a lot of cows pushing and whatever. Um, take a stick with you, make sure you're safe. Make sure someone knows where you are because, you know, you're unrolling in a lot of cattle. It's, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, and there was There's the question about the reseed. Yeah. Yeah. So um, reseeding, um, I haven't done it. Uh, I can't I never see the, the cost benefit stacking up. I've, I've done some broadcasting, a little bit of broadcasting, some diversity in. Um, I know there are some people, so Rich Thomas does some great stuff on Twitter, and if you follow him, he's really uh, trialed slightly different approaches. He's doing really interesting stuff. He's direct drilled into um, where he's bale grazed, and that's worked really well for him. Yeah, Rich is, I think, on the call, or he was, so maybe he could put something in the chat um, if that's if that's helpful. Um, right, just trying to get back through these questions. So... Um, Question about uh, how many grass species are typically typically in your sward um, and what types? And are there any that you're particularly aiming for? You've mentioned coxfoot and fescue. Yeah, well, if we're just talking about um, mainly talking about autumn and winter grazing, then the coxfoot and fescue I find are really good. The tall fescue, um, a lot of the advisors will tell you it's, it's, you don't want it. But I find the structure it gives in the sward and in the soil is second to none. Um, the other interesting thing about the tall fescue is it's quite unpalatable for, for most of the year. But once it's had a couple of frosts on it, it becomes more palatable and they start eating it. And so it's, I, I think those two are really good. In terms of the balance, though, you do need that diversity. I talked about red fescue because of the, the root mat that you get. Um, yarrow has a similar effect as well and you get sort of more fungal type soil associations that just just help you keep the sort of aeration in the soil and, and the structure um, but there's other species we look for as well so you want some productivity from so, something like a meadow fescue I don't like ryegrass at all so I'll try and avoid rye, ryegrass like the plague it's very shallow rooted um, it's not too bad in a mixture but it can to dominate if you're not careful and we're just turn cows onto ryegrass even if there's loads of forage they just get very loose very quick they get very hungry very quick they're just not happy happy cows it's just my opinion don't shoot me for it but i don't like ryegrass um 
Meadow foxtail is a really expensive seed to buy because the seeds um, ripen really variably on each seed head and actually across the population of grass in the sward. Um, so it's hard to harvest, but it's brilliant in terms of early season grazing. So, um, you know, you might see, um, I've had some people tell me they mute me on Twitter for March and, and April because I've got too much grass and it's upsetting them. But that's not really me or the system. It's because I've got loads of meadow foxtail and I've managed for loads of meadow foxtail. It's such an amazing early grass. It's absolutely brilliant. And um, if you can get as much of that as possible in there, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll drive past old silage fields that are getting loads of fertilizer and the and actually the foxtail will be up above the ryegrass. It's ahead of the ryegrass in that early season growth. So it's just brilliant for organic farms to use. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. Going to go back to Hay, just because there were so many questions. Um, Catherine's yeah. asking, she's out on the west coast of Scotland. They have one and a half metres of rainfall average a year. Um, she's asking about leaving hay out over the winter. Um, could it spoil or would it just be the outside? Um, because obviously it's, you know, it's not wrapped like if you were leaving silage out. Yeah, well, then then wrap it and leave silage out or haylage. Um, I think if you can... It's obviously it's hard. It's much harder to make hay up there as well, obviously, um, because of the weather, catching the weather. So, but I would try and make haylage as dry as you can, um, just because it hopefully then doesn't get so hot that you you kill all the seeds in there and you lose the benefit of the reseed from it. Um, but I I really would. You can yeah you can do it with with black plastic if that's the case and you can roll it out and people do. Um, so you know, hopefully we'll find some alternatives, but it's interesting when you actually talk to the recyclers, they need somewhere, the final use of recycled plastic, it can only be recycled so many times. So actually the black plastic is quite a useful thing because it provides a market for one more recycle of that plastic. So you know, it's not all bad. And as long as it then goes, you know, into the appropriate place, um, then you, you know, you should consider it. Great stuff. Um, OK, moving across now to slightly different topics. So George Burrell has asked about labour units per head. Um, are there any limits on this in the future with the growth in yeah. numbers and medical bills per cow? Are you routinely vaccinating or um, giving minerals to your cows? OK, we do so we take minerals first. We do min provide minerals. Um, we tend to do, I'll usually give them for a period and then, um, you know, we then we then they won't have them for, for a bit and then we can see how much see if they're really hungry for them so we might you know we might have a few weeks without it, it's not that like planned in, in the sense that we run out and then we have to buy some more so you know but i don't always keep a steady stock there on purpose because i do just want to have it on, uh, sort of an on and off some cows you can just see are just staying by the minerals and you see it tells you something about them in terms of the welfare side of that, people will often say, oh, you don't need to have minerals if you've got tree hay or if they're grazing hedges or if they're doing this or that. The reality of natural grazing systems is, this is just my opinion, but it's that animals will be roaming over many, many different soil types, getting all sorts of different mineral profiles from their forage. And if we're going to keep them in one place on one soil type, then we should provide them with the minerals that they might be lacking from the sward that they'd otherwise get from their annual migrations in a natural system so they're the minerals um we do not vaccinate anything um and it's just we find that the the selection pressure we put on fertility so if animals don't get in calf they're gone is enough uh, and so if there's you know we've, we have spoken to our vet about it and actually they were in agreement that you know if there was a if there was we've never we've tested for bvd for yonis for ibr for um uh, lepto you name it because we sell balls to people who want the tests done and we've never had a positive test in any of these things but i think part of that is because we're, we're probably outing anything pretty early if there's a problem with it um you know so i think actually that selection process which is what nature selection process is as well if it doesn't breed it you know it probably gets eaten or it, it certainly doesn't have that genetic input into the herd um tends to solve that problem for us and then there's a labor cost per head thing um yeah labor cost is actually i think 
if you need somebody, if you need to pay someone to do it, we've got to put our own labour into it. So if you've got to start a tractor and they're in a shed and it takes X amount of time to feed them, to be honest, I can go and I can easily, if I've set the bales out in the autumn, then I can go and feed in the winter um, by myself. You know, 60 cows might take me 25, 35 minutes to feed, um, you know, and it's done. So, you know, it, it, in terms of labour costs, it's really good. It's a really important metric for us to look at. It's a sad state of affairs, but the reality is in Australia, they're looking at 4,000 cows per labour unit. Um, and so we need to, you know, the reality is we just can't compete with that unless we have low cost systems like this. Um, and I say it's sad because, you know, we we don't really want bigger and bigger farms, um, you know, it, but that's a thousand acres. Um, you know, we've got one full time, one part time member of staff. Um, and we're a micro business. You know, we're not a big business, really. We're just a micro business. And, and that's just understanding what we are we're not big business people really in agriculture in this country we've got four three minutes left clocks counting down um i don't know if you're right to stay on for maybe an extra five minutes just we've still got yeah. 25 <laughs> questions yeah. is that right um so we've got a yeah. scenario from john so john has been grazing stockpile rested since april um on daily yeah. moves leaving really good residuals so he sounds like john's well on the journey with this does he says dare i graze a second time and give it 30 days rest or rest until next april pros and cons what would you do if you were john uh i don't quite understand but i'll say I'll, um so i i wouldn't graze it now if i wanted to graze it again well, i say that you know sorry i'm just gonna have to think for a minute um so yes i would lightly you could lightly graze it now and i i there, there are places the reason why i hesitated because i suddenly realized that i'm doing some of that at the moment um, and i think that's you know again hard and fast rules don't help with this and you do get a lot of stuff with mob grazing lytic grazing you must do it like this or that but try it trial it you you might your ground might react differently to mine um i would just say we will skip graze right up until dormant season and and the interesting thing that i find interesting about that is that dormant season moves for us so it's become later we, to be honest grass keeps growing because you've left so much behind and there's a thick thatch it keeps growing right into uh, sort of christmas day january ish and so actually you, you know you do get a bit of respite once you get into the system that is but you're just going to have to play it by ear make sure you've got some hay uh, in case it doesn't grow back and then and then try something next year there's quite a few questions more about herd and herd health but i'm going to focus on the ones that really relate to kind of outwintering just because that's the focus of this session um so there is a question around soil type so that any soil or land types that you think outwintering wouldn't work or tall grass grazing doesn't work i think it's a combination of your rainfall and soil type so here in Worcestershire, we've done this on very, very heavy clay on land that people told us, you're never going to do it. Um, you're not going to be able to do this here. But we've got 20, about 27 inches of rainfall a year. Um, now, so if we had a metre and a half of rainfall on heavy clay, I think that would be a real struggle. Um, I mean, having said that, in our wettest times, we are getting, you know, huge amounts. You know, I think we had... We averaged 27 inches, but I think we had 60 inches one winter. So, you know, and we managed it. So if you get your soil right, the other thing to consider is if you're on heavy ground is you can change your soil. So if, you, if you're on heavy ground and it's sticky, you can make it quite fluffy. Um, and, you know, just by, you probably, you might need to be really nice to it for 10 years in terms of, really careful winter grazing i do think winter grazing helps with the soil structure if you if you're really careful but have that backup that you can always take them in a shed but for you know if you get that right then your your soil is going to become so resilient that it's going to be hard to mess it up um and a quick one on herd health if it if it just clicks all those answers a lot of those questions is that we just find there's zero respiratory diseases with them outside we never have to trim a hoof um, we, we never get a lay mammal, very, very rarely, uh, you know, uh, there's plenty of cows there that could go lame. And I think that's down to the outwintering and the, 
the environmental adaption that the cattle have to it. So I think it's great for the, for the animal welfare. Yeah, we could do uh, probably a whole webinar on epigenetics and the benefits of outwintering for, for health and um, definitely agree that there's nothing like frosty ground for pedicure for cattle. Um, yeah. Tracy wants to know, how long do you aim to leave the winter grazed paddocks before you graze them again in spring? That's a really good question. Um, so what I tend to do is the first month of grazing, I'll actually, and I didn't make this clear, sorry, well, I will actually leave quite a lot behind. So we won't try and take that really, really short. And then, so if that's from say the 1st of December, and then we will start hitting it a bit harder because by the time we get into the growing season in sort of, you know, we're well into it in March and April, that first paddock that we graze is going to be, is going to get away. And, you know, if we're on a farm that's really wet, I might leave, I might leave a month ungrazed so that I've got something to go into for the first month so that I can start sort of, turn, I know we're outside, but turn out or, you know, the grazing of the, the new season grazing, growing season grazing plant starts a bit earlier. So I've left a month's worth behind from the winter. So just you just vary it depending on what your situation is. If you've got really dry ground, you probably don't even have to think about that. Um, the good question then after that is, what about fields which are waterlogged? How do you approach those in your system? Um, there's plan it so that you only grazing those when it's dry. And it might mean some years you can't graze them. It's just, just what it is. Um, you can, I mean, I, I would actually, depending on what, you know, I, I was speaking to someone the other day who actually just went out and they just said, look, we're going to just put in some, some really good herringbone drainage. We're going to drain these fields. And they were happy with it because they felt it was going to improve soil structure. They're going to have diversity in the sward. Environmentally, it was going to be better and they could winter out. And I, I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, but yeah, I tell you what, who would be a good person to speak to is Hannah Steenbergen, who's um, I went down and she, she's wintered out on probably the wettest farm I've ever been on in my life. And um, I think uh, it was quite, quite a dry time and we were sort of, I was up to machines in mud. Um, and um, yeah, so I think Hannah would probably know the most about that. I don't know if she's here, but she, she's definitely worth um, catching up with if you've got heavy ground. Yeah, she's a, yeah, definitely one to look for. She's on Instagram as Hannah in the Herd, if any of you are looking to contact her. And I'd also recommend um, Philip and Heather Close, who are in Ayrshire, and get something like almost two metres of rain um, a year and they're out wintering. So they'd also be good people uh, to, to look at as well. Um, right, I'm just going to do a last question. Oh, so many to choose from. Um, what rest period do you generally have and how many times will the cows be over the ground through the main grazing period? entirely depend on the ground so we might have we don't do this perfectly but we aim to graze the most recovered field block paddock net so we're trying to set it obviously if that means traversing the cattle over roads and arable fields and all sorts of things then we won't go and do that but we'll try and get there pretty as quick as we can we'll graze what's on the way but essentially, yeah, so some some of our land we might graze five times a year. Uh, some of it might only get a couple. Um, and then hopefully you improve the slower stuff over time and then and that improves and, and get more grazings and you can increase your stocking rate. Brilliant. I'm really sorry. We've got 20 questions that have gone unanswered. Um, so, but we are just going to have to draw uh, draw it to a close there. Um, what I will say is that Rob, along with Tom Chapman, is going to be delivering two webinars in January that are looking at um, grazing management and you know going into a bit more detail about some of the other aspects of the farming system. Um, and that's being delivered as part of the Future Farming Resilience Fund program. So if any of you are interested in that and you want to know more, you can contact me directly and I can signpost you to how you sign up for that. Um, it's Nikki, N-I-K-K-I at pfla.org.uk and happy to put you um, in the right direction for signing up for those webinars. There's about 50 webinars happening um, through that program across the winter. So we'd be really happy to, to support that, um, to support you to access those. Rob, I can't thank you enough for your time this evening. Um, it's been just fascinating hearing about what you've been doing and thank you for all the questions that you've answered. Um, 
Roly's just said, thanks, Robbie Legend. And I think that we probably all feel the same. So really appreciate it. And thanks, everyone. We've had um, 124 people joined us this evening. So thanks, everybody, for your time. Um, much appreciated. And uh, yeah, have a lovely rest of your evening. Thanks, guys. Bye.